It is uh, great to be here today, and uh, before we get started, I just want to ask for a, just a small handful of people to be prayer partners with me. So that just means to pray that the Lord will put his words in my mouth throughout this whole, uh, this whole message. Do we have a few? Fantastic. Just silently pray. I really appreciate it because it makes a huge difference because it is, it's never about the speaker. It's always about presenting the word of the Lord in a way that is easy to understand, practical, easy to uh, remember. So uh, before uh, we get started, we, um, let's bow our heads for prayer, and it looks like this is working now. Thank you, uh, Nason. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here to worship you. Please may this worship service bring you glory, and please put your words in my mouth, and please uh, speak through me, and may we receive the message uh, that you have for us here today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. On July 12, 1776, Captain James Cook set sail from England on a voyage to the South Pacific. This would be his third voyage to the Pacific, and he was, uh, he was a map maker and an explorer, and the uh, English throne had commissioned him to go map the Pacific. So he leaves from England, he heads south in the Atlantic to the Canary Islands, and then all the way south to the uh, Cape Town in South Africa, goes around Africa, and then starts heading east through the South Indian Ocean and passes south of Australia, and then gets to New Zealand, goes in between the North and South Islands of New Zealand, and then he starts heading north. Uh, he continues until he gets to the Hawaiian Islands some 18 months later on January 18, 1778. He was credited uh, as the first Westerner to go to the Hawaiian Islands, he is considered, from a European perspective, to have discovered these islands, and he mapped the islands uh, for the first time so that future uh, explorers could go and see them. After he was done at the Hawaiian Islands, he headed northeast to what is now the California coast, and he went all the way up the California coast towards Alaska searching for the so-called Northwest Passage, which was, at this time, there was thought to be some passage that could take you from the Atlantic to the Pacific, but they never found it. And uh, even though he never found this passage, his map making was tremendously valuable because it opened up much of the Pacific to future European and American adventurers and explorers who wanted to go see the world. Some 30 years later, in 1807, a 15-year-old Hawaiian orphan boy named Henry uh, Opahakai sailed from Hawaii to New Haven, Connecticut. He was invited to come on board this ship, and he was one of the first Hawaiians to come to the east coast of the United States. Once he was here, he began learning English and grammar, and he studied Christianity. He converted to Christianity and eventually translated the book of Genesis into the Hawaiian language. He was planning to return to Hawaii as a missionary, 
but his plans never materialized because uh, at age 26 in the year 1818, he died of typhus fever. It was very tragic, but during his short life, he was very impactful in terms of meeting other Christians. And just two years later, inspired by the work and life of Henry, a different group of Protestant American missionaries arrived in the Hawaiian Islands and began to evangelize. And we, we think about these missionary stories, and sometimes an idea comes into our minds as Christians. And the idea is that there is no hope for salvation, or no hope of salvation for the unevangelized. Okay, you sometimes think about, well, whether it be the pre-missionary Hawaiian Islands, the pre-Columbian Americans, or wherever the unreached part of the world is, you think, well, what was it like before the missionaries arrived, and what was it like after the missionaries arrived? And we oftentimes think, well, there was no hope for the unevangelized people groups. And it goes something like this. Uh, if they have never heard of Christ, they can't make a decision for Christ, and if they can't make a decision for Christ, how can they be saved? So just let's get a show of hands for a minute. How does that logic sound? Hmm? Do we have participants? How does it not sound? Okay, so nobody's voting either way. Okay, so we're going to read, we're going to turn to Romans chapter 10, and we're going to read some verses there, and then I'm going to ask you the question again, since we're not feeling very participatory right now. Romans uh, chapter 10. <clears throat> Uh, and we're going to start in verse 9. Romans chapter 10, uh, starting uh, in verse 9. That if you confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Continuing in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Okay, so... I'm going to ask the question again. Does this idea that there is no hope of salvation for the unevangelized people groups sound reasonable to you? Yes or no? Okay, we, we have a little bit of participation. Okay, now we're going to ask it the other way. Who does it sound unreasonable to? Okay, so we have just about five people who participated. So... I'm going to say, at first blush, it kind of sounds reasonable, but I challenge us to look deeper, as there is at least one implicit assumption that we have not addressed. But before we address that, let's get into why does this matter? Why do we care? Why does this question matter about these unevangelized people groups and whether or not they have a hope of salvation. We live in the 21st century America. We can't change the past. Our denomination dedicates significant time, effort, and money to evangelizing these groups. And um, we send missionaries to all sorts of parts of the world. So why are we talking about this thing of the past. And I would say that it matters because what we believe about this topic impacts our view of God's character. Okay? It impacts our view of God's character. And let's just do a little bit of compare and contrast here. 
on one hand, would God allow millions of people in unreached parts of the world, whether it be the pre-missionary Hawaiian Islands or the pre-Columbian Americas, to perish without hope of salvation? That's a question. That's one on one hand over here. On the other hand, would God give every person, regardless of where or when that person lived, many opportunities to say yes to him? Okay, those are the two things that we are looking at, and depending upon the answer to those questions, it may impact our view of God's character. And correctly understanding God's character is very important because it helps us to make sense of our own lives and to navigate through a, a perplexing world. We go through tough times in our lives. Uh, maybe that's losing a family member, failing health, struggling financially, living without intimacy, laboring without satisfaction, whatever it may be that is a tough time in our lives, looking at the situation through the lens of God's character makes all the difference. Maybe even the difference between giving up and maintaining hope. So that's why this topic is important, how God reaches the unreached. This topic is a mechanism by which we can better understand God's character. So let me give you a roadmap of where we're going on this. So we're going to start, and I'm going to put forth a counterargument to this idea that there is no hope of salvation for the unevangelized. We're going to spend most of our time on that. I'm going to put forth, uh, tell a couple of personal stories, cite multiple examples from Scripture. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at God's character, the plan of salvation, and then wrap it up and bring it all together. So please turn with me back to our Scripture reading, which is Psalm uh, 19 and verse 1. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Do you guys believe that? Fantastic. Our participation is improving. I believe it, and I have experienced it. And that really solidifies belief uh, experiencing it. So let me tell you a, a story. Uh, just a few months ago, on April 8 of this year, Caroline and I took the day off of work, and we drove from here down to Lake Avon, or Avon Lake, perhaps, uh, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. The reason that we went there is this particular place was directly in line with what is known as the Great North American Solar Eclipse. This solar eclipse started in the Pacific Ocean, went through Mexico to Texas, all the way through the United States to Maine, and then Canada, and ended in the Atlantic Ocean. And this particular spot in the Cleveland suburbs was an extremely good viewing location. And so we drove there, we found a great viewing location, we parked, we got there early with plenty of time, and we were ready to watch the eclipse. And the weather was perfect, and we had clear skies. It was an amazing experience. And there's some very interesting things in, that I want to talk about related to this eclipse. And I believe, and certainly for me, it was very much evidence of creative design, of God as the creator of the universe. This was not um, an accident the way this worked out. So I actually have a few slides. I don't normally use slides, but today I decided I would use a few. So 
Let's see if this will work for me. So behind me, you can see, and the screen compressed our perfect circles into ovals, but we have a picture of the moon and a picture of the sun. And what's very interesting about these two bodies is that from Earth, as we look up in the sky, they have an appearance of being the same size. Uh, yet, the moon is approximately 2,200 miles in diameter. That would be like going from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., while the sun is 93 million miles in diameter, which is so big we, it's hard to wrap our minds around the size, yet they look like they are the same in the sky because of the relative distance. And I just said 93 million, that's the distance. 93 million miles is the distance that we are from the sun. The diameter is 864,000 miles. So very big difference. So this relative difference makes the solar eclipses possible. If the moon were just a little bit further away, we wouldn't get solar eclipses. And if it were too close, we um, much of the solar eclipse would get blocked. And I'll show you in some pictures in a moment. So this maybe will be an illustration to help understand the difference in size. If the moon were a golf ball, the earth would be about the size of a cantaloupe about six and a half inches. Do you, do you know how big the sun would be? About 54 feet. 54 feet, that is taller than, this ceiling's about 40, 40 to 45 feet tall. It would be 54 feet. So it is so perfectly positioned that these huge bodies are exactly aligned the way they need to be aligned in order for us to see the solar eclipse. Now let me show you a few pictures. Here's a picture of me wearing the special glasses so that I won't go blind. And here is a picture of my camera that I took pictures of the solar eclipse with. And then here is what it looks like as the solar eclipse is coming in. So these are pictures that I took. The first one looks like somebody took a bite out of a cookie, and then as the moon moves more and more in front of the sun, it gets smaller and smaller until you get this. And maybe we can turn the light off here for a moment. You can see this is what is called the diamond ring. This is why I don't use slides very much. Okay, the diamond ring. So you can start to see around the outside of the moon the atmosphere of the sun, and then the sun is shining there. This just happens for about one or two seconds. And then you can see this. This is what's called Bailey's Beads, which is where the valleys and the craters on the moon are catching just the last gleams of light from the sun, and then you get here to the full solar eclipse. And during this time, we could take off of our special glasses and we could look with our naked eye right at the sun and moon together. And where we were located, this lasted three minutes and 53 seconds. It was uh, an incredible experience and I felt like this was evidence of the creative design of our Father in Heaven. We can turn those uh, lights back on. Thank you, uh, Nason. Now, there, there has been a, uh, there's been a trend over, for quite some time now, for well over 100 years, towards urbanization. So that means people moving from the country into big cities. And uh, what has happened is in, in 1972, approximately 37% of the world's population was in urbanized 
areas. And over the next 50 years until 2022, that number increased to 57%. So now well more than half of the world's population are in urban areas. And in the United States, it's far greater than that. And at the same time, the number of people who consider themselves to be Christians has gone down. So in the United States, in 1972, 90% of Americans considered themselves Christians, and 5% considered themselves non-religious. Fast forward 50 years, and that 90% number do drops down to 63%. So in 2022, 63% consider themselves Christians and 29% consider themselves not religious. And what is interesting is at the same time this is happening, we are disconnecting from nature. If we could get those lights just one more time here. So this is a picture of the Milky Way. And from... Less than half of the people in the world can see this from where they live. We cannot see it from where we live. There is too much light pollution and air pollution. And so in order to see this, you have to travel to a more remote area. And so you can see that there's this disconnect. As we get disconnected from nature, we're getting disconnected from God, because as we read earlier, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the works of his hand. We can uh, turn those uh, lights back on. Thank you. So there's a quote I want to read from Testimonies uh, for the Church. Wow. Um, we may want to think about a different stand here. Good thing these are built sturdy. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. <laughs> okay, so we'll just get right back into the flow of things. So, uh, there is a quote from Testimonies to the Church, volume 6, page 185, that I want to read. Next to the Bible, nature is our greatest lesson book. Next to the Bible, nature is our great lesson book. So there's other things in nature other than the sky. Uh, animals. I want to spend some time uh, talking about animals because God can use animals as a way of ministering to us. Please uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to read verse 28, focusing primarily on the second half. Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 28 said, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so we see that there's this relationship with, between humans and animals that was established at Eden. And we see that there's examples throughout the Bible of where animals are obedient to God and serve human beings. And we're just going to go through a few. Let's flip a few pages to Genesis chapter 7. And uh, we're going to read verses 8 and 9, Genesis chapter 7. And this is when the animals go on to the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verses 8 and 9 says, Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds, and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. So the animals were obedient to God and came for the service of of humans. Now turn with me to 1 Kings uh, chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, and uh, here we see that uh, uh, ravens fed. 
Uh, verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. This is when Elijah was in hiding. The ravens were obedient to God and fed him. Now, uh, turn with me to uh, Jonah. And uh, you know, there's a lot to cover in Jonah. So uh, instead of going there, let's just, we know the fish was very obedient to God. He was obedient in saving Jonah's life and swallowing him for three days. And then he was also obedient in delivering Jonah onto the beach. Okay, so we see other examples, Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, we see that Daniel was unjustly thrown into the lion's den. And when he was there, the lions were obedient to God and did not harm Daniel. And let's turn now to Mark, uh, uh, Mark chapter 19. I'm sorry, I've gotten this uh, this one mixed up. Hold on one second. Well, um, I mixed up my verses on this one, but we see the story of when Jesus was the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He enters and he rides on this donkey. And what I find most interesting about this story is that it is a unbroken donkey. It had never been ridden before. And for any of those here who have any experience with horses, you don't want to get on to an unbroken horse because it's extremely dangerous. Yet this unbroken donkey donkey was completely obedient and serving humans. And then our, our final example is uh, found in Luke chapter 5. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verses um, 4 through 8. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so they uh, began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. So we can see that the fish, the whole school of fish that was right there in that part of the lake was obedient to Christ. So there's, just, there's all these examples. We could get more, but the point is that God can use the sky in nature. He can use animals to minister to us. And I have a, uh, um, a quick personal story I can share. If I can uh, go get, get one more slide here. Oh, it's not working. I can tell it without the slide. That's fine. So when I was about 13 years old, I had my horse named Ben and I was out late at night alone on the horse, and I had gone several miles up into the mountains away from my parents' uh, property to visit my brother who had been camping up there. And I get up there, I managed to get there pretty well, but on the way my flashlight dies, and it's a pretty dark night. And my horse was able to take me completely home without 
any guidance from me, without any lights, and he knew exactly how to get from where I was. I, it was too dark for me to see the trail several miles away, and this horse was able to take me home safely. And I believe that, I believe that animals, including horses, are obedient to God and that they want to serve people because of what we read in Genesis. And so I know for those of us in automotive, we talk about autonomous vehicles and all this technology and GPS. You know, the horse was the first autonomous vehicle. <laughs> so, okay, now there's another avenue that I want to explore as this counterpoint to this argument of no hope of salvation for the unevangelized people groups. And that is throughout Scripture, we see examples of angels ministering to people. Please turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. Uh, Genesis chapter 16. Uh, verse 7, this is the story of uh, Hagar and uh, Ishmael. Genesis 16, starting in verse 7. So Hagar's been kicked out of the camp. Sarah is not, uh, not happy with the situation for um, obvious reasons. And Hagar leaves. So picking up in verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, and it was that spring... Uh, that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sari, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mit mistress, Sari, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that you will be too numerous to count. So we can see here the angel is ministering to the distressed woman in this story. Now, let's turn over um, and look at Genesis chapter 19, just a few pages over. And here, Lot and his family are about to uh, leave Sodom because the angels. So, the angels came to rescue them. The two men said to Lot, and these are the angels, do you have anyone else here, son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you. Get them out, because, you, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against the people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So the angels come and rescue Lot and his family. We have a, another example. This is one of my uh, favorite examples. This is in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 19. I remember this from the uh, illustrated children's books. Uh, First Kings uh, chapter 19, uh, verses uh, 4 through 8. This is after Elijah flees from Jezebel. He goes out into the desert and he's in a bad situation. And the angels minister to him. While he himself was a day's journey, I'm reading from verse 4, 19 verse 4. While he himself was a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat underneath it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. At once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. I'd like to try some of that food. Uh, <laughs> it lasted him quite some time. So we can see here that the angels were ministering to him. And then one more example is found in uh, Matthew chapter 4. This is after Jesus has fasted for 40 days and he's out in the desert. And 
Uh, he's, he was tempted. We know he was tempted three times by the devil. He answered by quoting scriptures. The devil left him, and then in verse 11, we say, it says, the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. So we see all of these examples of uh, the angels attending to people. So why does God evangelize through nature, animals, angels. And I would say it's because not everyone has access to a Bible, to a missionary, to an evangelistic series, to a church, to the internet. But God still wants all those people to have an opportunity to say yes to him. So he has all of these mechanisms. So remember, I said earlier that there was an assumption that was built in to this idea that there's no hope of evangelism for the unreached. Well, here's the assumption, and I would say an incorrect assumption. God is limited by the same constraints that limit us. This is not the case. God's abilities surpass our wildest imaginations. And we should not put constraints on him in our own mind. Of course, missionaries and evangelists are super important. That's why we support them. We should support them. Um, but let's not forget God is not limited to human agents alone to fulfill his purposes. In addition to humans, God uses nature, animals, angels, and other mechanisms that we may not understand to fulfill his purpose. So, why does he do this? Why not just um, use human agents, and I think that we need to look at a few verses to better understand the character of God to answer that. So please turn with me to one of my favorite verses, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 3. 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 3, says, this is good and pleases our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. So we can see here that God wants everybody to be saved, so he's going to be using many, many, many different avenues to try to reach us and give us many opportunities to say yes. Please turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 9. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We can see here that God provides us with many opportunities to say yes to him, to say yes to his plan of salvation. He is patiently waiting for us. Thus, God gave us the plan of salvation. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace... You have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So he provides us this plan of salvation, and then he gives us many, many different opportunities to say yes. Now, 
Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse uh, 12. Uh, This is Peter preaching uh, before the Sanhedrin. um, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. And he's talking about the name of Jesus Christ. So, Yes, salvation is found in no one else other than Christ, but it doesn't mean that every person who receives salvation has a perfect understanding of the plan of salvation. Okay? Some may know just enough to say yes. And there's a, a, a really interesting quote from The Desire of Ages, page three, or, um, page 638 that I want to read to you uh, that I just find fascinating and it kind of, it was, it was a big part of this whole topic. Um, Desire of Ages, page 638 says, Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly. Those whom the light is never brought by human instrumentalities, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things that the law required. The works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. So we can see here that we don't want to limit ourselves to thinking only by human terms. We don't want to, in our minds, put these constraints on God, a God that we, is so powerful we cannot fully understand him. And he has so many additional mechanisms for reaching people than we do. So sometimes uh, we develop opinions that seem reasonable and logical without considering the full implications, such as this idea that there is no hope of salvation for the unevangelized. So what must be true for that opinion to be validated? And the answer is that God would have to be constrained by many of the same limitations that limit us as humans. Because he is able to reach. And we've seen the examples. We see reaching through nature, reaching through animals, reaching through angels. There were other things we didn't even talk about, like reaching the unreached through dreams. We see examples throughout the Bible, whether it be Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar or others, that God reached through these dreams. So uh, I just want to, we just have a couple more verses I want to uh, read before we wrap up here. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32 and uh, uh, verse 27. Jeremiah uh, 32, verse 27. And God is speaking here to the prophet. He says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? So he is asking this rhetorical question, is anything too hard for me? And the answer to that is no, nothing is too hard for the Lord. And we need to have an accurate understanding of God's character so that we can have a fuller relationship with him and he can help us make sense of our lives and navigate through this sinful world. Then we will become powerful witnesses for him and tell people how Christ has changed our lives. Our uh, final verse is found in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 
Revelation uh, chapter 4, and we see that the angels and the 24 elders are praising Christ, and they say, uh, 20, uh, Revelation 4, 11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have being. And this comes to our hearts and minds as we see God's creation and as he ministers to us through all of these many means so that we can be reached by him and we can say yes to his plan of salvation. May we praise our creator every day. Amen. Please uh, bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity to worship you. And we ask that you put a clear understanding of your character in our minds, that we don't limit you by human constraints, but that we understand that you are seeking us, that you are chasing every human being trying to get us to say yes to you and yes to the plan of salvation. Please be with us. May we follow you. May we say yes to you. And may we spread your love to everyone around us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is number 633. Please turn in your hymnals to number 633 and stand as we sing, When We All Get to Heaven.
before our benediction, just wanted to note tonight there will be Vespers at 7 p.m. And as always, we'll have our uh, midweek study Wednesday at 7 as well. Psalm 147 says, Praise ye the Lord, for it is our for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. The Lord lifteth up the meek, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. Who covers the heaven with clouds and prepareth rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow upon the mountains. He gives the beast his food and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of man. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. Amen.